with me to Joel, the book of Joel. And what I'd like to do is read from verse 23. That's chapter 2, book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 23. Hallelujah. Starts and says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, For he has given you the former rain faithfully. And he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. That's all forms of curse will be removed and God's people will be restored. And he says, my great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. I'd like to be part of that group, amen? Not that, uh, you know, we want to get overweight, but uh, to eat plenty and be satisfied is wonderful. Why? Because... Whenever we get around a table, whenever we share food, there is fellowship and covenant that is established. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And I am the Lord your God. And there is no other. Then he repeats this. He says, my people shall never be put to shame. I'm glad he repeats that. Amen. (laughs) Because as you try and fulfill God's plan and purpose in your life, there will always be people that will try and oppose because that's how the devil tries to stop God fulfilling his plan and purpose but it says that you can't be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward. After what? After the former and the latter rain has been given. So if we're looking at this, the fulfillment of this very well-known promise where God's Spirit is going to be poured out. In other words, there will be true revival. It says, and I will pour out, and sorry, and it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. Today I want to talk about the former and the latter rain. I think it's really important that we understand this biblical principle. Because we all want revival. We all want to be revived. We want to be restored. And they know part of revival is restoration. And we see that clearly here. That all the things that the locust, no matter whether he's a crawling one, a flying one, he, you know, one that just nibbles away. And you, you get locusts in your life. You get the ones that are just nibbling away all the time. They're all going to be dealt with. Why? Because there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Next week we've got Rodney here. I can assure you there'll be an outpouring. I know his ministry. God always does that with him. So today we're going to examine the Holy Spirit as the former and latter rain, but with special emphasis on the latter rain in the context of revival. 
There are many different opinions about revival. Therefore, we must keep our eyes on Jesus and not be drawn into the prophecy mongering because that will keep us constantly looking for the Antichrist. I just don't know why people spend all their time trying to figure out when the Antichrist is going to come, who it's going to be, what his shape is, how is it coming from the north and the east and all this stuff. And millions and millions of books have been sold and read on all this stuff when God is not interested in you knowing because he says clearly that you won't know the times and the seasons, that he reserves that honor, that privilege for himself. But what he does want you to know is that's it. That's what God prophesied. That's it. That's, that's the correct way for us to view prophecy. We want to be on the lookout to go, that is it. That's what God prophesied. That's what God said through that prophet. Do you see, it's a big difference from trying to figure out, well, at exactly six minutes past six on the sixth month of the sixth year, that's going to happen. And the Antichrist is going to be... How many Antichrists have we had? I mean, you know, I know Kissinger was one. Poor guy. He's still alive. Uh, um, you know... Of course, Hitler. Yeah, anyone that the devil uses in his, for his own, we, we now put as, as some kind of antichrist. Um, even Kennedy was accused of being the antichrist. So, yeah, and people have written books that, you know, on such and such a day this is going to happen, and be, behold, it never happened. But they don't go and give their money back to all the people that bought their book, do they? <laughs> so just be careful and don't get drawn into this contemplation of prophecy. I want you to realize that prophecy is about knowing. He's giving us information about what is going to happen so that we, when we are watchful, go, ah, that's it. Amen. The three last parables that Jesus ever gave to his disciples before he went to the cross were on the subject. The parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, 1 to 10. The parable of the talents, verses 14 to 30. And the parable of the judgment of the nation, verses 31 to 46. The first parable, the one about the ten virgins, was given that we should be watchful. Watch therefore, for you know not the hour nor the day of his coming. Well, it's a bit of a paradox, that, isn't it? But it's very clear that we won't know, but we need to be watchful. The point of the second parable, the one concerning the talents, is that you are to be faithful in what God has given you to do. So we got watchful. We got faithful. And the third parable is the one about the judgment of the nations where they are judged according to how they have dealt with little ones. And this is the word of the Lord to be merciful. So we have three things there, watchful, faithful, and merciful. That is our state as we see the day approaching. So the Holy Spirit is deeply interested in you knowing something about prophecy, but only in the order that you should be faithful and that you should be watchful and that you should be merciful. For they are the three tests of genuine faith and not whether you know who the Antichrist is. It is in this context that I want to talk to you about the prophecy of the latter rain. He has given you the former rain, and He will give you the latter rain. Joel 2, verse 23. Our focus is going to be on the Holy Spirit as the former and latter rain. Let me ask you something. Do you really expect revival to happen? Put your hand up if you do. Hallelujah. Give me a wave. Praise God. Turn around to the pastor and say, sorry, the person next to you and say, 
I love the pastor. <laughs> oh, I just feel that love. <laughs> right. If the answer is yes, then you inwardly feel um, something that is in full agreement with the voice of the Holy Spirit in you. Because the Holy Spirit wants to bring restoration and revival. He's not holding back. He's not going, I don't want to do this because they're not good enough yet. It's not about being good. It's not about being perfect. That's why Jesus went to the cross. It's about what God has determined and, and has willed to come to pass. God is a, a God of revival. He loves to revive and restore His people. God is not a God of death, but a God of life. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly, John 10, 10. Joel 2, verse 20 says, He has given you the former rain moderately, but He will give you the latter rain abundantly. This really fits in with our concept that God is about to do something incredible. So what is the former and latter rain? When David mentions in Psalm 65, um, about the former and latter rain, he, he points something out, and I think this is a really descriptive thing. It says, you visit the earth and water it, you greatly enrich it, the river of God is full of water, you provide their grain, for you have prepared it, you water its ridges abundantly, you settle its furrows, you make it soft with showers, and you bless its growth. The former rain is given by God to soften the soil, to settle the furrows, and to make what was hard, dry ground soft enough and able enough for you to plant seed. So we see that God, for revival to come, for Him to, for us to see uh, the results of him pouring out his spirit, that certain things have to take place. This soil, this nation is rock hard. Amen. But how, how he has to water it. That's the former rain. He's got to water it so that we can get seed into the soil. And I think that's been going on. I think from the day of Pentecost, there has been a watering, a preparation for, for seeds that have been sown and sown and sown. But you know, then the latter rain comes and gets what? Something incredible happens because the latter rain comes at harvest time and we're going to see that. Hence God, by the former rain and by the moisture in the soil and the soil, sorry, causes the corn to spring forth, verses nine and ten in, in Psalm sixty five. If you looked in the margin of the King James Version, it says, You visit the earth after you have made it to desire rain. You visit the earth after you have made it to desire rain. I think that's an incredible image. This is in verse 6. Oh, sorry, verse 9. God provides desire before providing for the need. One of the greatest principles that God works upon is that He satisfies the desire of every living thing. Psalm 145, verse 16. Yes, He satisfies the desires that He has provided. And note... With us, desire is always a matter of the heart. If you keep pressing into God and you delight yourself in Him, He will give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you your heart's desires. That's Psalm 37 verse 4. He will not do anything against desire. Nothing that the earth Sorry, notice that the earth desires rain, so he satisfies the longing of the earth. It's as if the earth has its mouth wide open, waiting for God to pour out something. 
rain. Right now, there is a longing. And only God knows how much measure is needed to satisfy that desire, that longing. Now, I want us to realize that too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So when you get to a place where you're saying, Lord, keep raining, keep raining, keep raining, in fact, the produce gets weaker, not stronger. Anyone been into a cornfield? At any, um, we South Africans or Africans should know about cornfields. I mean, they, they're everywhere. Um, it's interesting because, you know, if you go into a cornfield, um, you know, you, f- you hear the rustling if there's a wind. Uh, and, and, of course, you see the, the, the corn stem growing uh, and, then, and they have these ears that, that, that open up when it's, fully, um, when it's fully matured and grown. But as it grows, you'll see there are notches all the way up the stem. And those notches are there to keep it upright, keep it stable. However, if you keep watering it, guess what happens? The stem just goes... Once there's anything heavy on top, which is the fruit, it just collapses. Now, it's no different with us. What is needed is a dry spell. So the last thing you do to corn is overwater it. If it keeps raining, has anyone seen a cornfield in the UK? Yeah. Yeah. You agree. It, you know, you don't keep watering them. They, 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 it just doesn't happen. But you go to Africa and places like that, the, the dry places, you find a lot of very strong, healthy cornfields. So what am I trying to say? I'm saying that in order for you to be strong, maybe sometimes you need some rain and then some drought. And it's in the drought that you get strong. Without that, the latter rain, which comes before the harvest, has no real effect because you've saturated the soil, you've saturated the plant, the plant, the stem is weak, everything, it just doesn't work. God may often may bring you through times of dryness in order to make you strong. Why? Because he, that's a sign that he loves you. There are periods in our lives when God brings dryness on our souls and into our lives. You may go through a time of heartache, a time that things are going wrong, a time even when you feel like God's not with you. You listen to the psalmist, he says, my, my soul feels like parched land. Guess what was happening? God was growing him, <laughs> strengthening him during that time. And this is a man that God says, he's a man of my own heart. This is going to make us strong. I hate to say it, but too much of a good thing will make you weak. And that's why the Lord brings you through the drought. It's not a sign that the Lord has abandoned you. Rather, it's a sign that God loves you. Then after the drought comes the latter rain. Just before the harvest, God sends the latter rain in order that there may be an abundant harvest. For that rich latter rain gives you full ears of corn. It's amazing how God's timing. As I said, here we have the earth as if its mouth is wide open. Its desire is full for rain. And God says, I'm going to pour out the former rain, satisfying that only he knows how much (laughs) because he wants a strong Christian. He wants a strong servant. So in your life, you might be saying, pour out more, and he might be saying, no, no, that's enough. (laughs) You've got that first notch and things are happening and things will grow. But then when you start to bear fruit, 
and then the fruit is, 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 is fully ready, then he pours out the latter rain. So in Psalm 65, the first portion speaks of the former rain, and then it, from in verse 11, it brings in the latter rain. You crown the year with your goodness. This is the latter rain. When God crowns the harvest year with his goodness, only the latter rain can give an abundant harvest. Have you ever heard of a field of wheat singing? Again, if you've been to, and I, when we were young, we used to, sort of pop over the fence and, you know, the, the, the farmer didn't like it because he'd come out with his shotgun and they had these, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it was salt, or salt and pepper, you know, and he'd sort of fire it at the kids that were running around these fields. Um, but when you were in the cornfield, the first thing you noticed is that there were noises. And as as... You, you listened, it, it was because there was a rustling, and it was as if the, the field was singing. It's just like the Holy Spirit. See, at the moment, he's, he's blowing through this harvest field, and the harvest is ripe, ready for picking. And the field itself is singing. Why? Because he's there. He's blowing through it. So if you listen with your spiritual ears, you will hear that harvest time is almost there. Amen. But it's also a time when there's most disruption. It's also a time when the devil comes and tries to get those who should be in the harvest field disrupted and looking at other things that are unimportant. But if you listen with your spiritual ear, you will hear the field singing. How it rustles when it sings. But it will only do it when it's good and when the ear is full, when it's just about ready. It doesn't sing when the ear isn't formed. It sings when the ear is fully formed. And this is what David is speaking about in Psalm 65. Earlier I stated that I strongly reject what I call prophecy mongering. There are people who read endless books on fancy views of prophecy, all of them telling you what is going to take place. But you see that it's not God's way. The key to prophecy is not this is going to happen like that on this specific date. The key to prophecy is this, is that which God has spoken about. Something incredible is about to take place. Amen. That which the prophet Joel spoke out is about to take place. That's the latter rain. That's the Holy Spirit. From the day of Pentecost, which I believe was the former rain, where God started to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And we see the incredible results of that. Then there were dry periods as each notch in the stem was placed there to make the body of Christ stronger and stronger and stronger. But now the fruit is there. The ears are open. The field, the harvest field is full. And if you listen, you'll hear it singing because the Holy Spirit is moving about, ready for the greatest outpouring the world has ever known. Oh, but Pastor Chris, how can you say that? Because in my spirit, I sense the time is, is, is coming. Does that mean we're all going to be raptured? In I, I, I don't know about that stuff. I don't really want to know about that stuff. Yeah, one day we will be raptured. And, you know, we might be astonished who isn't there and also who is there. But it doesn't bother me that. You know, we've got work to do. We've got work to do. That's important. That's why we've got to say that's it. That's what God prophesied. That's what he spoke out. Now we've been watchful. We've been faithful. We've been merciful. And we've seen it. 
Hallelujah. Aren't you excited about that? Because you are that generation. We can truthfully say that God has fulfilled his word concerning the former rains because the latter rains are coming down soon. This is that which God has prophesied. We are nearing the time when the Son of Man will reap his harvest. The latter rain always comes before the great harvest. We, we can safely say that Pentecost was the former rain, that there has been dry spells, long dry periods between, but there's been a spiritual strengthening through that. And there's, you hear so much negative about Oh, well, you know, you know since, since the early church, we've not seen all these signs and wonders. Yeah, but m maybe that drought is just God strengthening the body. Hello, have you ever thought of the positive? Maybe if it was all happening all the time, that we'd be weak. But it strengthened us. Why? Because we are now more watchful, more faithful, more merciful. I believe God is about to give us an abundant glory shower of latter rain. Hallelujah. And there are people running out there looking for A, Bs, and Cs, and perfection, and that. Let me tell you, if you find a perfect church, the moment you join it, it isn't perfect. <laughs> no, I'm not being, it, it, really, this isn't about finding perfection. This is about souls in God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. Jesus said he came for the sick, not for the perfect. In fact, the people that he hammered most, and let me tell you, some of the things he said were pretty strong. You whitewashed tombs, you brood of vipers. Well, the people that thought that they were perfect, that they had it all. This is like the story where, you know, this guy's marooned on a desert island, and after like 30 years, they uh, come and they find him, and, you know, he's living on the beach, and they look down, and they, they, and they see three huts. And they said, well, why three huts? He says, well, the middle hut is where I live. He said, oh, no, what's the one on the left? Well, the one on the left is uh, the church I go to. And I said, and the one on the right? He said, it's the church I used to go to. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same with a lot of people. I mean, you know, them and the church, they just will find another church. But the thing is, this is not about perfection. This is about souls, the great harvest of souls. In Revelation 7, 9 and Genesis 13, 16, it says, there will be a great multiple, multiple <coughs> multitude which no man can number. So just think, you know, we've had Billy Graham where, you know, I don't know how many tens of millions of people have been affected. It's basically what God is flagging us down on. It's saying that you won't be able to, to count the, the, the number. No one will be able to get up on television and say, oh, I've reached 50 million people. It will be impossible to count. Why? Because the Spirit is being poured out on all flesh. Everywhere, everywhere is revival. A respected historian quoted another church historian named uh, Husey and uh, says that in 50 AD in the early church, if uh, one was a true member of the church, three things had to be present. One, you had to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins in water. Two, you had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And three, you had to call and declare Jesus Christ as Lord. Three simple things. That was what qualified an ordinary Christian in the early church around the day 
of the apostles. Today, we've lost the eminence of the Holy Spirit. See how things have changed. We acknowledge Him as inspiring the Bible and writing the Bible. We often say that He inspires the preacher. Hallelujah, that was an anointed word. We've sensed the Holy Spirit. We also say that you know, during worship, we, we, uh, we sense the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the worship. But there's one thing that's missing. See, when Jesus, when we declare Jesus Christ as Lord, and we can't do it except by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what the Word of God says? So, when we declare that Jesus is Lord, we can't do it except by the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Now, the one explanation is that Jesus always revealed the Father. He says, whatever you see me do, or if you want to see the Father, you, know, you can see him in me. But that, that, that the Holy Spirit is here to reveal Christ. So, as, as Christ revealed the Father, the Holy Spirit reveals Christ. So, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But if we do declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is here to manifest Christ as Lord, are we allowing His presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit, to manifest the Lordship of Jesus? I think that's where we've missed it. Because this is what the outpouring, the revival, the restoration is about. See, when we say Jesus is Lord, we must expect the Holy Spirit to manifest Christ as Lord. In other words, the, He will rule and reign. He will be master of the universe. He'll be master of the nation. He will be master of the church. The Greek word there is gyrios, Lord, Master. And what we fail to focus on is we want His presence and we acknowledge His presence. We acknowledge that He writes the Bible and breathes life and inspiration into it. We acknowledge that when the preacher delivers a message that that word is, is, is full of life because the Holy Spirit has breathed life into it. We acknowledge it during worship as we worship God. The Holy Spirit fills us and that we sense the Shekinah glory as we worship. But we fail to acknowledge, and that's the third thing that they did, that when, Jesus, when we say Jesus is Lord, that the Holy Spirit will manifest the Lordship of Jesus in our midst. If He is here, and He is, we should sense and acknowledge His Lordship. The first thing we do is to acknowledge His majesty. In other words, there's reverence. But that's why I don't buy into chaos in church. Because if you really believe that the Holy Spirit has manifest the presence of Christ, that, that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is here, the first thing you will do is you'll be face down on your, you know, that proskinel, that's worship. That's falling down, face down before the Lord. So there's this balance where, yes, we must be joyful and exuberant, and we see that in the Bible. But when we really acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we switch into a whole different dimension. That's where the outpouring is. Amen? That's where revival is. That's where the former rain, that's what the former rain has prepared us for. This is the latter rain that the Bible is talking about. And I'm ready for it. And really, if it's If it's going to happen, I want it to happen now. Amen. Because let me tell you, if you look around, it is parched, the land. But we must be strong because God has prepared us for this. He's prepared His church. 
Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. We know he's loving, deep, personal interest in every one of us. But what do we know today of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ as being in our midst, as being the Lord, true Lord, Gideos in the church? Very, very little. I believe that when we confess Jesus Christ as Lord, then surely we must acknowledge the person he sent to dwell among us and manifest his divine presence. We need our Lord to be Lord more than ever. We need revival. So we need the latter rain. And as the word of the Lord says, I will give you the latter rain. And the floor shall be full of wheat. And the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. And you shall know that I am in the midst of you. And that I am the Lord your God. And no one else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Implying that without revival, without restoration, comes shame. Because what we're preaching <laughs> isn't manifesting. But God will not allow the body of Christ to be ashamed. That's why he's sending the latter rain. That's why next week when Rodney comes, something is going to start. That's why, and it's not about a man, it's about God's timing. That's when we're going to say, this is it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, let us also acknowledge that his lordship is being manifest in our, pres in, uh, our presence by the Holy Spirit. Consequently, the latter rain will come and a great harvest of souls will be ushered in every time we meet. And accompanying this outpouring will be signs and wonders in a measure that the world has never seen before. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and even greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. What is that saying? If he didn't go, the Holy Spirit couldn't come. But because the Holy Spirit has come, the latter rain, the latter rain, is being poured out, is raining on God's people. Why? Because there's going to be a great harvest. Are you ready for the great outpouring, for the great awakening? Remember, prophecy is founded on this simple truth. That is it. That is it. That's what we've been waiting for. That's what God has prophesied. That's what was written in his, in his word. That is what he showed us. We recognize it because we've been watchful, we've been faithful, and we've been merciful. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I can stand before heaven and earth and say that, that the leadership of this church has been faithful. Amen. That we've been watchful. And that we be merciful. Why? Because we love people. God is about people. God is about people. One person is more important to God than 10,000 religious people. You're going to see your desire, your hunger for God is going to increase. I pray that he shows you how parched you really are. I pray that like the earth, the soil, we stand there with our mouths wide open saying, Lord, just fill me. Fill me. I want to be filled. Because he only satisfies desire. There are too many Christians that have no desire other than just cruising along what we call cruisomatics, or the only desire is to find fault, or the only desire is to try and get profile. But that's not, our desire must be, Jesus, I want more of you. 
pour yourself in me. That's the, the Holy Spirit pours out. You know, we say, oh, Lord, fill me. With what? You haven't got some gas canister, and then, you know, you, you talk with like methane, what they call it, little voices. No, when you say, Lord, fill me, he's filling you with the presence of Christ. He wants you to be more like Christ. He said, fill me that I be more like Christ. Let Jesus be Lord. Kyrios. One thing you hear in the Greek Orthodox Church all the time, the moment you walk in, you Kyrieleison, Kyrieleison. You know, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. What are you doing? You're giving him his rightful place. You're saying, we, we need your lordship. We, we need your mercy because we are such a wretched bunch of people, whether we like to acknowledge it or not. In God's eyes, without the blood of Christ covering us, that's who we are. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord because we have been cleansed in his blood and we can come boldly into the throne room and we can make petitions because... Christ went to the cross and suffered. But now there's work to be done. And the latter reign is being started. It's, it's happening. And that prophecy in Joel that God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. He started in the church, but it's going to just spread. Hallelujah. Do you sense the anointing? Do you sense that? The Holy Spirit is now saying yes because he's manifesting the lordship of Christ in our midst. Jesus is Lord. First thing it should leave your lips in the morning is that. Jesus is Lord of this day. Jesus is Lord of my life. Jesus is Lord of my activities. He's the Lord of my possessions. He's Lord of... Declare him Lord of everything. Jesus Christ is Lord. It's the Holy Spirit manifest the Lord's presence, manifests his, the, 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 this authority that he stands in, manifest the Lordship of Christ in my life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We trust you enjoyed this program. For more information on Life Matters and Cornerstone Church, visit our website at www.cornerstonechurch.com. We hold our Sunday services at 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. at Sandown Park, Asia, Surrey. We are a family church where all are welcome.